Okay. Uh, what I've been told is it has a really good mic. That this okay. unit has a really good mic. So okay, so let's turn to our panelists. So what I've asked them just quickly to do, if they would, to kind of prime our pump a little bit, is to give us some reactions, some reflections on the tabletop discussions that they were just participating in. Then what we're going to do is we're going to start mm -hmm. and just go around the tables and see what questions. And folks, I recognize this is really, really hard to do, is to come up with one or two central questions. First of all, you all want to talk about your projects, right? Because that's what you've been putting so much time and energy into. And um, oh, thank you, David. Terrific. And, um, and so I know it was hard to come, but, but we'll work with that. We'll see what you've got, and in, in our panelists are not short on experience. So um, what did I say we're going to start with? Marie, I think we're going to start with you. Oh. Darn, I was going to All right. So actually, Ray and I were at the same table, so it'll be interesting to see if we've heard the same things. But um, there were four very interesting um, projects that folks were working on. And uh, so some of the themes that I heard, because I was listening, and even though it, it, as I was listening to the specifics, I was trying to move it up into um, some themes or some more contextual um, uh, thoughts about this. So one of the things that I heard was it's really about change management um, and I know you guys read about this and talked about it and so much of what you're grappling with is how do we change um, entrenched roles, responsibilities, context, culture, etc. Um, I also heard uh, some control issues and this is normal human behavior that there are certain people who have certain jobs that are, you know, kind of in control of some resources and they kind of like it like that and a little hard to bump up against that. Um, it's interesting though because sometimes these are approached negatively and I, I get that. I talk about it too. This person's dysfunctional, this person's so negative. And, um, so what, what I also... Um, would do is, is talk about reframing. So I've heard a little, or at least in my head, I think it's important to reframe these things not as this is bad, this is negative, this is terrible, although it feels that way on the days that you're dealing with people, but that there are, these are, these are normal human behaviors, organizational behaviors, <coughs> and whether it's online education or something else, uh, these are the kinds of things you're gonna bump up against. So as you learn to move through an institution, you know, take this as an example. Organizational structure, I thought that there was some struggling with where does this belong, whatever this is, I think. Um, and um, also the role of online education, very related in the institution. Is it central, is it decentralized, is it on the periphery, uh, where is it? And I've heard a lot about lean resources and establishing foundational pieces, um, and I would, encourage you all to think about, even though we lean and establishing foundational, that you think about how to make this more mainstream part of the institution and get the resources that you need. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of what I heard. Excellent. You know, and it's interesting because um, I'm fortunate to be this bridge between uh, Marie and Gary because I think I'll start right where you're talking about and lead to what I, <laughs> I expect Gary to uh, speak about. But I think um, I think we really need to kind of look at the, uh, the culture of the institution. And, you know, we talked about a lot of operational topics and a little less about strategic topics. Now, um, I know we have to, those operational topics are right in our face and uh, we're dealing with faculty members who don't don't like the idea and don't like change and don't get the vision. But I think as we speak to those faculty or speak broadly to those challenges, we need to vision, let's say five years ahead. You know, what are things gonna be in 2018? Or maybe, let's say 2016, just three years or four years. And envision not just metrics, not just you know, we now have 18 degree programs online, we're gonna have 42. You know, it's not, not just quantitatively, but culturally, and that's really mm -hmm. building out what Marie says. How do we change the culture in the next two or three years at our institution so that our job can, so that we can be much more successful in our job and so that we can affect change 
for the future of our institution. And so I think that's a really important piece of, of almost all of the issues that we're going to be talking about uh, today. And, and certainly I understand the operational and uh, understand that very well. But I think it is really the strategic, and I'm gonna kinda pass over to uh, Gary to talk, I, I'm sure he'll mention uh, uh, strategic approaches. Strategic approaches. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right on cue. Uh, our, our table uh, talked about several things that I think do kind of overlap. One uh, is the question of how you go about assessing potential for new programs and uh, how you make decisions about programs and that kind of thing. How you go about establishing criteria so that everybody feels they're being treated fairly, but also so that good ideas come to the top. That's one big issue. <clears throat> a second big issue was accountability. And accountability in the sense of uh, who are we accountable to and who is accountable for some of the things we need to be able to do. How do we establish a, a kind of accountability network uh, within our institution so that everybody knows that they've got a responsibility for a certain aspect of success and everybody else is dependent on them doing their job as well as us doing our job. Uh, and then the third related area has to do with culture and, and the, the fact that, as I mentioned at our table, we, we in higher education have one of the most decentralized organizational cultures uh, that you can imagine. And it doesn't really matter where you are. Uh, it's, it's a very decentralized decision-making process, an authority process. Uh, most presidents and chancellors can only <coughs> ask so much of a faculty member uh, before the faculty member just says, I will wait you out. <laughs> 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 and so the question of defining accountability uh, is, I think, very important. And mm -hmm. underneath that, I think, uh, is that at, our, at the stage of online learning that we find ourselves in, most of us at the ta at, around the room, at our institutions, <coughs> are asking the academic culture to do things that no one else has ever asked them to do before, at scale. Mm -hmm. In other words, we're saying, you have to offer a degree online to new people, and that's gonna require your faculty to work differently. It's gonna require you to make new connections outside the institution. Be responsible to people inside the institution in new ways. There are very few positions around our institutions, other than us, who have ever asked the academic side of the institution to perform that way. Uh, even the provost cannot ask much <laughs> of, of an academic unit. So it puts us in a very visible uh, position and also a position that requires us to be diplomats and ambassadors for what we're doing. And I think that goes to culture change and the fact that we're, we're in a really unique period in our, in our institutional history. So a lot of the discussion around the table had to do underlying with, with that issue. How do we go about effective change in this very decentralized environment? Good, thank you. Um, if I could just make an observation as well, moving around a little bit. One of the things that I heard uh, as a theme was the, some of you find yourselves in positions of uh, influencing change, of sort of stimulating, if you will, managing, negotiating, but you don't always necessarily, or you haven't been necessarily given the authority for that change. Yes. And that's, that, that position is a really uh, tenuous one, and, and it requires some uh, strategic sort of, uh, strategic is the wrong word, but you know what I'm saying, maneuvering. Yeah. And maybe if you wouldn't mind starting off with that, and then we could pick up on your things. Gary? Well, just, just to follow up on that, in one case that we talked about, the president of the institution had very clearly given authority to somebody to make changes, but no one else did. <laughs> And so campus chancellors, department heads and deans, individual faculty. Vice presidents. <laughs> it did not matter what the president said. This is how we do our business at our institution. So uh, authority is more than just position power. It's got to be a, almost like a community trust to move ahead. And developing that community trust is very difficult to do. Yeah. Well, Larry and I were talking about that. And I, I'm in a very similar situation that you just summarized. 
I think there's also another nuance to it, which is that you may be seen at the institution as the person with the authority, but you haven't been given it officially. Yeah. So with all of those, what Larry suggested I might want to bring into the conversation here is, well, how do you as a leader um, start to get the authority or whatever that's missing so that you really can be effective? And I, and I think that that's, for some of us, that's this master's level that we were talking <coughs> about because now we're really dealing with the leadership within these very complex institutions that it's all decentralized but someone's told us, go forth and do, and it's really hard to go forth and do. Yeah. You know, I would say that leadership has less to do with authority mm -hmm. and much more to do with uh, strategically uh, assembling faculty champions, mm -hmm. campus leaders, mm -hmm. campus thought leaders, um, stimulating enthusiasm. You know, at the University of Illinois, uh, proudly, we have uh, forced two presidents out in less than three years. <laughs> um, and, and now we find it very difficult to hire, hire anyone. But, um, Got a couple of them. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. So, we have one of your people. Right. So, so there are all of those challenges. And, and there's a difference. You know, I think leadership is the key. And I think we have to really internalize that. As a leader, you know, you, you lead uh, faculty, staff, administrators, and in many ways by example, but you also uh, lead them by, by conferring or, or deflecting the spotlight, reflecting it onto those people who, who exhibit the behaviors that you're trying to spread across the campus. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would also say that it really, I'm sorry, but it, it depends on the context, so you need to know your culture. And so in some institutions, we're actually a little more centralized and probably top down than uh, a lot of institutions because that's the way we, we were developed and, and designed and I really don't want to work anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but, but even, he, even at my institution, we will have people who are told, you know, go forth and do this. But if it hasn't been actually, if that person hasn't been anointed, there's a lot of bumping and, you know, who are you to tell me? Mm -hmm. And so you, you need to know in your institution, is it important to have the president send forth a communication? Or would that kill it? Or is it better if you mm -hmm. form an advisory group of the constituent groups that you need? Or is that the, the appropriate thing? So you've got to know, you've got to find the people who know how to work your organization. And every culture is slightly different. But there are ways to get this done, and you've got to get all those people on your side. Right. So at, at every institution, there is a process, as Marie said. Uh, at Penn State, for instance, we have a process where certain things get approved by either the Graduate Council or the, or the Faculty Senate. Mm -hmm. The strategy, then, is to go to the Faculty Senate and the Graduate Council and say, I've been charged to do this. I need your advice on how to proceed. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have a vehicle, and you, maybe you put together a, a task force or a committee that says, let's look at how some of these issues are going to change things at our institution and say, how do we manage that change? I'll, I'll give you one quick example. Uh, when we first started to offer master's degrees, we wanted to offer master's degrees for online. Uh, question arose, Penn State master's degrees require a residency. So we had a conversation about why. Why do you require a residency? And the answer that came back was, we require a residency because we want our students to become familiar with the academic milieu in which they're going to work as they move into their doctoral programs. Uh -huh. So that had to do then with preparing academics for academic careers. And I said, well, but if I was in a professional master's degree, I was preparing to be a practicing engineer, for instance, wouldn't I want to be in the milieu of engineering out in the field? And we had a serious discussion about those kinds of issues, and finally the Graduate Council said the World Campus may offer professional master's degrees, but it may not offer the MA and the MS, which are more academically directed and require a residency. So that gave us a starting point, but it was their decision. <laughs> Nobody imposed, what, what we imposed on them was the need for a decision. Uh -huh. But what they did was make the decision about how we could move ahead. That's, it's like working at the United Nations. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> but, it, but it is what higher education is set up to be, a very decentralized power structure. Amanda, I think you might have had a question. Sure. Um, so, you know, to piggyback on what Gary said about process, I worked in research for five years before I came to undergraduate education at Penn State. And, you know, one of my things that's always shocking to me, speaking of process, is um, you know, the speed to which that process goes. Mm -hmm. So it's so slow and us mm -hmm. and you know, even if we're the best innovators, which I consider myself to be an innovator and a change agent, and we want to get to where we want to go or we have dreams and visions, um, the process is slowing us, you know, it's a turtle and you know, I'm a rabbit and I wanna <laughs> go faster and I'm impatient. And I think coming from the research world you know, you could get expedited research reviews for human subjects and a lot of other things, but we don't do that for curriculum. You know, if I decided today I wanted to offer a program, <laughs> the chances of me launching that with approval anytime soon, you know, like January, if that's, you know, three months away, to me I could launch a research project in January, be all approved, you know, have people hired and all of that. But in you know most of academia, the curricular process isn't matching the marketplace, right, right. and and how we can get that. And one of the things we talked about at our table, you know, over the summer, faculty, many faculty don't work over the summer. You know, we have one board of trustees meeting over the summer, and if you don't get caught in time for that, then you're waiting till fall. So, I think the process is the one of the greatest challenges for me, and the speed of that process. And and I think what you need then is, is kind of a two. A two-pronged authorization. One is you need a you need the president, the chancellor, the provost, somebody saying, as an institution, we want to do this, mm -hmm. and then they have to charge the academic bodies with figuring out how, and coming back to them, not to us, but to them, with how are we going to do this? What standards are we going to use? What level of accountability is there going to be? All of that, the academic rules then we have something we can work with. Otherwise, we're all stuck with the faculty saying, that's your problem. <laughs> you know, and, and you don't want that. Hey, Gary, let me say that there are ways, there are ways on every campus to work around the structure to expedite the process. Now, I'll give an example, but I, but I'm, uh, I won't give the name. But, except maybe maybe at that reception. Uh, <laughs> but someone we all know, okay, someone we all know who has a very large, very large online program, a leader, a fellow, etc. And um, she described to me as she launched that program that she gave stipends, summer stipends, to each of the members of the faculty steering committee to test out online learning and she gave them full service and out of that it was sprung the, the, the trap was open so that everybody then you know they were sold on online learning they had the support they saw what it was they got they got support and um, and it turned into a very very large very successful program so you know and it's not the only one there are rifts on that all over there's so many ways that you can can look at that, but but don't be afraid to work a little outside the box. You know, nothing illegal, but <laughs> but a little outside the box to get things accomplished. That's what summer stipends are for. Yeah. Yes. And do uh, do any of you have enrollment issues at your universities just in general this year? In other words, our enrollment's yes. down. Oh yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So here's where I would really uh, capitalize on the fact that we are also being uh, we're under great pressure just because enrollments are crashing for most yes. folks. The demographics are changing, whether it's traditional age students or adult students, the sequestration has really, I mean, we, you know, my institution is in the Washington DC area. We are now seeing a long trail of that because people are running out of tuition assistance, mm -hmm. they don't have jobs, et cetera. You can be a solution provider, but you need to be creative and you need to go to, to be able to go to your provost or your president and say, you know, we can grow the online programs, but we can't go through two and three years because by then the project Smart. management degree is gone. Right. And it maybe can't happen at all of your institutions, but some institutions have set up a separate expedited review process for the online programs. Now somebody will have to 
work with faculty, negotiate with faculty. But if somebody doesn't bring this up as an option, as a let's think about doing this, the provost will probably never think of it on their own. So think about going forward with that. I mean, I think the idea of everything has to wait for a very sort of old structure of we ponder for three years. Uh, presidents are looking for solutions now, so so maybe help them with that. See if it works. Let me know if it works or if you get fired. <laughs> so um, we'll go here to Heather, and then I think Sandy has a question. Uh, our our table discussed a lot of the, like five different things, uh, but they kind of rolled into governance issues uh, that were at different levels. They, they, they started as broad as the accrediting agencies, you know, state authorization, for instance. How do we handle that, you know? Um, and then at the institutional level, uh, and uh, it just how do you, you know, like, you were talking about responsibility and accountability for, you know, amongst the groups and that kind of thing. And, um, and then uh, have it at the, um, even at the platform level. Because one of the situations was that, uh, how to leverage a platform when the institution doesn't support it. Uh, in this case, it was, uh, of course, it was a platform. Mm -hmm. so any comments? Still time to pull the question out of <laughs> yeah, so Give us a punchline. <laughs> what would that do? How should governance be constructed and educated and, and institutionalized? in order to get this education out there in a timely manner. Let me give you one summary of the little conversation we had at the table I was at. Um, had to do with MOOCs, and you were, you were talking about uh, trying to get the institution interested in MOOCs. And where we ended up was, you need to have some criteria, decision-making criteria. Now you can suggest some decision-making criteria to people, but you also can engage them in establishing those criteria. So under what circumstances should we do this? Under what circumstances can we reduce the risk of doing this, depending on the environment of the institution? Who's asking the questions, though? Excuse me for interrupting. No. But, but who, who is asking those questions? Because that's We're the asking, governance issue. We, we are asking those questions as a governance issue. We're saying. Who's we? Uh, we, the people in charge of online learning at our institutions, are asking. And asking of whom? Huh? And of asking whom? of whom? Okay. The scenario I would suggest is the president has charged you with exploring this issue, mm -hmm. okay? So you're not doing it because you want to do it, you're doing it because the institution has asked you to move this ahead as an institution. And that might not always be the case, just to you set you got to find somebody to ask you to do it. Yeah. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> well, we, we have those issues here that we don't have that. Okay, yeah. And then once that's happened, you say, I want to serve my institution. I need to know what are the criteria that should do that. Now, you might say, back to whoever asked you, should we form a task force? Should I have lunch with the deans? Should we go to the faculty senate? Should we use your presidential council to discuss these issues? But out of that comes, here are other circumstances. Now you've got a list of three or four or five things that would be success factors. And so you can go to the departments and say, academic units and say, uh, do you have any programs that meet these criteria? And at that point, you can start collecting ideas. <coughs> Let's say you get five ideas and you want to do two programs. Now you've got something you can go to a dean's council, faculty senate, whatever, and mm -hmm. say, how do we narrow this down? Mm -hmm. We want to go to the best possible program using these criteria. Mm -hmm. And you're doing it all, not because you want to do it, but because you've been told you need to do this, this is, you're acting on behalf of the institution, you're using criteria developed by the academic leadership, mm -hmm. and you're working within the community. It's, that's the strategy yeah. for me, is to always make sure you're working on behalf of somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> I want to comment on that as well. You know, Ed, um, when, we, when we started the online program, um, I had just finished my term as vice chair of the faculty senate. I had 27 years on the faculty, full professor. Um, and 
the faculty, when I recommended it, in fact, I previously had been president of the faculty union, they said, no, oh, it's okay, you know, I think it's all right. And then, then, then a little later, it got a little larger, and the chair of the faculty senate said, this is getting too big. I said, we're never going to go over 20% of our credit hours. <laughs> now we're 42.3%. <laughs> well, these things are incremental, and they take time. But my point is, you need to pull in, befriend, bring to the table those persons give them a summer, get them to teach online, yeah. those people in governance so they understand because they, they don't understand yeah. until they've done it. And so that's the kind of outreach you need to do. You make them part, you know, part and partner. Mm -hmm. And now, in our case, every faculty senator teaches online. Mm. So it's not that they, they certainly don't blindly, you know, vote for anything related to mm -hmm. online but they all understand. At least they're informed. They understand. Can, can I interrupt us just briefly? We just have a news bulletin in. Sue, uh oh Sue, did we lose them? Yeah. Shoot. We were all gonna say hello to Andrew Burrell, oh. Elizabeth Greener. So, right. and what time in the morning would it be for them? Oh, um, it's 5 a.m. for one and 6 a.m. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. Hey, that's fair game, right? I mean, the sun's starting to come up, so they're in Australia. So if Sue can get them online, I'd like this to say hello. But what I, what I wanted to ask uh, from that is it sounds like you're talking an awful lot about the politics of the academy. And, and Ray, you said something about uh, thinking outside of the box and being creative within, within legal bounds, of course, always, but being creative. Uh, coming up with strategies that are political in nature. That is, I'm going to I'm going to pull in this faculty senator, and I'm going to have them teach it for a purpose because I know down the road. Uh, what other kinds of techniques and creative strategies have you either done or seen that, that help us? This is what we were talking about, Christine. Gary. Very early on, we had this actually preceded online learning, but we were talking about distance education and using technology. Uh, our vice president for outreach at the time, Jim Ryan, set up a leadership retreat. Uh, the provost and the undergraduate provost, graduate people, a, a small group of uh, key people, key deans and administrators, all of whom had the ability to say yay or nay and be helpful or be unhelpful. And then he brought in uh, people from outside the institution who were doing things with technology the way we wanted to do things with technology. So we had Ford Motor say, here's how we're using satellite to train people at our dealerships. Uh, he had a, a couple of universities come in and says, here are how we are interacting with major employers uh, to deliver uh, training programs to their employees. Here, we had success stories. But people who were considered to be peers uh, of our institution or friends of our institution talk about how they were using the technology. And then we had a conversation about what does this mean for us? What should we do? So rather than go in and say, you know, I know all about this stuff and I'm going to tell you what we should do, we said, we know we've got an issue here. Let's find out what other people are doing and then decide what we're going to do. <laughs> and uh, that opened the door, frankly, because then people were able to see peers that they respected rather than, you know, yeah. people oh, around the table. It's the external versus internal expert yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree. Help everybody else around you be smarter than you. Exactly. Yeah. Really, uh, you have to be without um, arrogance and without you know agenda, and just sort of make sure everybody else is bringing these ideas. Mm -hmm. Sometimes what I what I've really found is sometimes if there's something that I really want to see happen, it's really best if I just shut my mouth, which is very hard, <laughs> very very hard. Because you know if you're excited about something, yes. you know, yes. mm -hmm. but you sort of you wait, and especially now there's so much going on with social media and inside higher ed that if there's a hot topic. Somebody is going to read about it, you know, probably know about it faster than you these days, but let other people start bringing that idea. And I find, this is something that has worked really well, actually get to a point where you let everybody around you say, when are we going to start looking at competency-based education? Like, oh, yeah. Even though six months ago, I really wanted us to look at that. 
So it's better to let people think they're forcing you to do it rather than, you know. Now I know that sounds, but I really think that's about helping other people feel that they have agency and that they are smart, which they are. But you can't always, especially if you tend to be like an innovator and you're a visionary. You know, I have a new idea every day and people get sick of me because they just don't hear it anymore. But you've got to really empower other people bringing in speakers, sending people to conferences, you know, send more of folks to Sloan yeah. and yeah. come back with four ideas. Okay, okay questions. Get her question. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Heather. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, the question I had, I actually asked the table, but I kind of wanted to ask it to the larger group because I'm kind of hoping there's some more conversations that come out of it. Uh, and the question is, uh, how does geography impact leadership or one's ability to lead? Uh, do you have to be right in the center of things to be an effective leader? It's a, it's, it's actually a pivotal question for me because it's going to, it's a key decision. A oh, quick answer to that, but or, or a piece of an answer. Um, you know, again, we're talking leadership, Not and work. and right, and so that the key is.